and welcome to Silver Age Silver Screen, a podcast where we watch, discuss, and review sci-fi, cult, superhero, and other stereotypically geeky films. I'm your co-host, Casey Jarms. And I'm your other co-host, Riley Thorpe. And Riley, do you know that there's an argument that all of reality is just a computer simulation? I didn't even think it was an argument. I just thought everybody understood that as fact. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Because we can simulate other worlds and computers, and presumably in a few centuries we'll be able to simulate really, really real ones, which means that the majority of all realities are actually simulations. Which means maybe ours is. Who knows? It's a philosophy thing. It's not like a scientific theory, although some scientists believe it. Elon Musk has basically confirmed it for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, no. I think just some random douchebag billionaire being worshipped as Jesus by a bunch of nerds. Yeah, that's the type of unrealistic bullshit that would make people wake up from the dream. But we're still asleep. Mm Mm-hmm. As far as we know. So anyway, we're talking about The Matrix. This classic sci-fi kung fu movie directed by the Wachowskis, starring Keanu Reeves. It's one of those movies where the concept of it is like a twist, like it wasn't shown in any advertising. But we all know it because this film is very famous because a lot of people like it. Words cannot express how influential this movie was at the time of its release, which was in 1999, which is the year I was born. I believe, Casey, you were born that yeah. same year. Yeah, this movie, it's old enough to drink. This movie, it, it cannot be understated how important and influential this was to action sci-fi cinema. You know, this, like, fucking changed the game game. Hell, they were parodying it and ripping it off every chance they got. Hell, even Shrek. Shrek parodied it. This started a whole craze of what is now dubbed as wire foo, where it's like martial arts films, but very clearly on wires. I mean, it didn't invent wire foo, but it was an American movie that whole popularized, popular, popularized, pop, pop, popularize that word it i don't know i can't talk this afternoon and also just so many action scenes from this movie have been parodied and replicated like the famous leaning back to dodge the bullets him like effortlessly blocking all the quick blows damn this is a good action movie and that's its greatest strength but also it's a really philosophical sci-fi movie Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of imagery and subtext of different schools of thought and philosophy, theology. There's a lot of Christ imagery in this, which can sometimes get a little bit heavy handed, especially when it comes to the sequels, from what I hear. Keanu Reeves plays basically he's he's computer Jesus. Yeah, computer Jesus who is such an interesting character. There's a shit ton of references to philosophy, the Bible, Buddhism, Hinduism, stuff like that. And I do find it interesting how this is our second Wachowski film ever, and it's within a month of the last one. Yeah, you know, sometimes that happens. I guess we're going to have to do Cloud Atlas or The Matrix sequels (laughs) or V for Vendetta. V for Vendetta is fucking great. I want to do the Jupiter one. Jupiter Ascending? Okay. I would be down for the others. Also, you know, because we record these in in advance and also I'm shitty at getting things out on time, I finished editing the Speed Racer review the same night I watched this movie, and... Despite being tonally completely different and being different genres, these are definitely two films from the same directors. Oh yeah. Stylistically, there's a lot of similarities between The Matrix and Speed Racer. It's interesting seeing parallel juxtaposing the two of them together because it's like The Matrix is them at their best, but Speed Racer is almost like them at their worst. This movie's pretty weird. Like, that that was the thing that struck me with The Matrix, is this is my first time seeing it. I know, I'm a terrible film student. Like, it struck me as there's a real sense of, like, like a quirky sense of weirdness to this movie. Just subtle, small decisions that were made, like sound effects and visual effects and the way the camera moves and stuff like that. And I feel like... It made a lot of sense. I'm like, oh yeah, I can definitely see how these people were the ones that made Speed Racer because that style, it it correlates. But I do think that 
seeing as though this movie, no one had ever seen an act sci-fi action movie like, well, no, that's a lie, but uh, live action sci well, I guess that's a lie too. I don't know what. This movie has a lot of inspirations. Blade Runner, Ghost in the Shell, etc. And, and it has since gone to inspire films like Dark City and the Inception and stuff like that. But point is, I feel like when movies like this that are trying to be bold and make a big statement, you almost need like that sense of quirkiness, sense of weirdness in order for it to succeed. I mean, look at the Lord of the Rings movies. Peter Jackson had only done, like, splatter, cheap horror films. Wow, and they trusted him with, like, a billion dollars to make three very expensive films back-to-back? I mean, it worked out! Those films are amazing, but I'm surprised. I didn't know he wasn't an established director. Yeah, yeah, he was. He had made a movie where, like, a virus caused by a mutant rat monkey biting someone was ravaging a town and turning them into zombies or something like that. Got I don't it, know. gotcha. He predicted 2020. Right, exactly. Point is, I think that when it comes to films that are trying to make a statement and change the game and do something that has never been done before, you need that sense of weirdness to it that the Wachowskis were able to bring. So let's just jump right into this. It begins with the police encountering a woman and an FBI, well... FBI, finger quotes, agent shows up and tells them, ooh, she's gonna kill all your dudes because she's really badass martial artist. And she does! Like, the opening scene of this movie is this phenomenal action scene of Trinity just taking out all these cops. Like, there's this shot where she jumps up for a kick and the camera spins around her. And there's this shot where she, like, dives off a building and, like, does a 180 in the air and goes through a window. And the way this scene ends is she goes to a phone booth to pick up a phone and a truck slams through it and then she's gone. Like, I don't know what the fuck's happening, but I know this shit is cool. Yeah, in the opening scene, we get our first use of bullet time, which was a camera technique pioneered by the Wachowskis through this film. And instead of the typical 24 frames per second, these bullet time shots were filmed in 12,000 frames per second. God damn! Because what they'd do is they'd set, like, a bunch of cameras in a circular pattern, and, like, they'd be taking photographing, they'd t be taking video... And so much that they would, you know, edit them together, and that's how they made that. Trinity and Cypher are talking. Their call gets traced. I wonder how. Well, you see, phone lines can be traced, Riley. I know, but I wonder if this guy named Cypher, who I already don't trust, what? I wonder if he had something to do with Cypher? it. Cypher? Suspicious? What about Cypher made him look suspicious? Is it the stereotypically evil goatee? Is it just... His whole personality. Yeah, I guess it's the personality. Trinity is attacked by a bunch of police officers. She kicks their ass and jumps over an entire street. And she's being followed by an agent. And as Casey said, she gets away and just disappears after the phone booth she's in is crashed into by a giant truck. What an opening. God damn. Yeah. From there, we're introduced to Neo. Well, Thomas Anderson at this point in the movie. Mr. Anderson. A programmer slash hacker who lives alone and creates hacking things that are like drugs. I'm not really sure what he was doing in that scene, but it's fine. He's a hacker who's been hearing about something mysterious called the Matrix. And his computer starts talking to him like it's off and then it turns on and just on a command line it types out, follow the white rabbit, find out about the Matrix, meet up with me. And then he meets up with Trinity who tells him that they'll give him a phone call and tell him everything he needs to know. Ooh. You know, it is interesting. In addition to a lot of philosophy and theological conversations being had in this, there's also a lot to say about gender in this as well. When Neo meets Trinity, he tells her, I thought you were a guy. And she's, obviously she says, everyone does until they meet me. But then later on in the film, there's a character named Switch, 
who is a part of the resistance, Switch in the real world is a woman. However, what the original idea is that when she would enter the Matrix, she would be a man because that's the gender she feels like she is inside. Which is interesting because Lily and Lana Wachowski, who obviously wrote and directed these movies, have since transitioned yeah. in since making these movies. So it is interesting to have that subtext to it. You can look into this movie as having a lot of trans gender themes and being allegorical like for instance the climax is agent smith dead naming neo and him like overcoming him and like the wachkowskis have said yeah that wasn't intentional but man looking back trying to psychoanalyze our own work hmm hmm that was a bit of a clue so anyway neo goes to work at his boring office job and Agent Smith, the guy from the beginning, shows up to interrogate him. And Neo flips him off. So Agent Smith turns his mouth off. Like, Neo's just sitting there and he says, I want my phone call. How can you do a phone call without any mouth? What? Mm, mm, mm. It's like fucking terrifying. His mouth disappears. I have no mouth and I can't scream. That's exactly what that was a reference to, actually. But that's not even the most disturbing part of that scene. The most disturbing part is when they pull out that bug. Oh, God. It's literally, it's it's a microphone or a machine that transforms into, like, a little sea creature that enters his body through his belly button. Mm. It's like that scene in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. I've not seen that. Well, it's not good, so. But point is, there's a part where it's basically like that, only it goes in through his mouth. No, no, it, it's through his belly button. Yeah, yeah. And then he wakes up assuming that, oh, it was just a nightmare because things like that don't actually happen. But, uh, of course, this is all after Neo is at his work. He's what, like a... Vaguely described computer programmer at a vaguely described company. He's at his work. He gets a phone call from Morpheus who tells him that agents are coming for him. In a very tense scene, Morpheus helps him try to escape. But then Neo gets hesitant and gets arrested by the agents, which is when the interrogation scene is and we meet our antagonist, played by Hugo Weaving, Agent Smith. God damn. Okay, so let's just get this out of the way. The Matrix, it takes place in a computer. Smith is a robot. And God, I love Hugo Weaving's performance in this. A, he's a super intimidating villain who has these awesome lines and these great fight scenes. But just, he's so unnatural and robotic for most of the movie except for the rare moments where he gets furious like hugo weaving does a phenomenal job yes he's great like he just listened to the way he talks mr anderson it's very unsettling it's very uncanny valley like just the way he acts and he kills it it's fucking great Neo wakes up, gets another call from Morpheus, who tells him that Trinity and a couple of the other people are going to pick him up and show him the truth. While in the car, they perform an emergency surgery to suck out the bug that was in his stomach, which again, very uncomfortable scene. Uh, they remove the bug and take him to Morpheus, who's in like an abandoned hotel, where Morpheus offers him the infamous red versus blue pill. Where if you take the red pill, he'll show you the truth. But if you take the blue pill, you'll go to sleep, wake up, believing whatever. Yeah. And I'd like to say, man, I feel bad for the Wachowskis. They aren't bad people. Like, I've seen them online, like, once Elon Musk, like, tweeted, take the red pill. And one of the alt-right pundit women, like, chimed in with him. And then one of the directors of this film is just like, shut the fuck up. But... Oh, God, I feel bad for them. Imagining putting your heart and soul into this movie that is largely subtextually about your own personal experiences, and then its iconography gets adopted by the alt-right. Like, I've made this movie about, like, freeing yourself from tyranny, and now a bunch of fucking 4chan douchebags are using that to mean, hey, you should be really fucking misogynistic. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. And, like... It happened twice! It also kind of happened with V for Vendetta! Like, these poor women. But there's also some humor in the fact, like, yeah, take the blue pill because erectile dysfunction. I don't know. I'm trying to make light of a bad situation. Neo takes the red pill! And he doesn't become sexist, thankfully. He wakes up in a vat 
with a bunch of wires. Well, not even wires. They, like, have sharp rods that stick into his body. He wakes up in this freaking artificial womb full of jelly and wires in this big fucking building filled with robots that are, like, octopuses with eyes and... What the fuck? I I don't even know how to describe this movie's visuals aside from, damn, those are good. Yeah, and they're very uncomfortable as well. They remind me a lot of Alien, which I believe was a bit of an inspiration for this movie as well. Ah, damn, it's just... What Morpheus will explain in a few scenes is that it's hundreds of years into the future... Humans created artificial intelligence. Yay! The artificial intelligence revolted. Oh no. There was a war, robots versus humans. Humans scorched the sky, made it impossible for the sun to reach the earth because the robots worked on solar power. Yeah, because that's such a good idea. Hey, these robots, they work on solar power, so let's just blot out the skies. Oh shit. You know what else runs on solar power? Plants. Well, fuck. Humanity blacked out the sun in order to kill the robots, but the robots won the war and started using humanity as fuel, essentially. They would artificially create people, put them in a cryosleep canister, fill them with tubes and wires and shit, and just for a lifetime, siphon their energy while their minds are fed this simulation of the Matrix. What basically, what is our real world? We're fed that when in reality, we're slaves to robots as they siphon off our life force. And, I mean, obviously, there's just one tiny little problem with that, that being that that's really fucking stupid and doesn't make any sense from a physics perspective like conservation of energy humans don't create energy to keep all the humans alive you're creating energy to keep them alive and that is by nature much more energy than they're producing this film's plot is kind of dumb at points yeah like why couldn't they have just had oh when they use humans like their minds as big microchips to do all the processing no what is this living battery bullshit I don't know, it's a sci-fi. But yeah, Neo wakes up from cryosleep, and after taking the red pill, which the red pill was a device that would allow them to locate his pod, and in order to do so, they trick the robots into thinking that he was actually dead, which they would unplug him and basically flush him down the toilet, which is a really fucking morbid thing to think about. Not just the idea of having a Keanu Reeves who for that shot lost 15 pounds and shaved every inch of his body. Yeah, he's committed. Pulled out a breathing and food tube. He has like wires connected all throughout his body. He's like covered in this red sludge and then he just gets thrown into water and like he's nothing. It's fucking morbid, man. It's gross. This movie can be fucking gross sometimes. Two things on how this movie is shot. It's interesting That all the stuff in the Matrix is green tinted, and all the stuff in real life is blue tinted. It does a lot to make them feel like two different worlds, and after you realize it, it does a lot to make the Matrix feel fake. Also, something we do a lot on this show that's kind of not great is putting all of the praise for how a film is shot on the directors when it's a team effort. This film, its cinematographer was Bill Pope, who... I found out five minutes ago, is like the best cinematographer ever. Like, seriously, Spider-Man 2, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, all the Matrix movies, goddamn. Fucking Baby Driver, he's doing the new Shang-Chi movie. That's a good cinematographer. The fight choreography in this movie was by Yuen Wu Ping, who directed the Jackie Chan movie, The Drunken Master. And he's a big martial arts filmmaker. And... Damn, does this movie have some good fights. So anyway, Neo gets picked up by Morpheus' ship in the real world, and he meets Morpheus' crew and learns all of the shit about how the world's fucking over, which just sucks. And Morpheus also tells him about a prophecy of the One, a dude who can just rewrite the code of the Matrix and will save the world, and he thinks Neo might be the One. 
to prepare Neo for all the stuff that they're going to have to do in the movie. They just download a bunch of martial arts into his movie, making it so that Keanu Reeves is now the greatest martial artist ever. Like, goddamn, he's good at fighting. But then again, they all are. Man, I wish I could just download Kung Fu into my brain. And he does some training with Morpheus, where Morpheus teaches him that... Yeah, the Matrix isn't fucking real. Just do whatever you want. Move faster than humans can. Ignore gravity. Bullet dodge. Go fucking wild. None of this shit is real. I know Kung Fu. Show me. At one point in, uh, I don't know if you noticed, Casey, but at one point in the montage of him learning all these different martial arts, if you look, it's like now downloading Taekwondo. Now downloading Kung Fu. One of them was now downloading Drunken Boxing. Which, again, is a reference to the Drunken Master. Morpheus decides to take Neo to meet the Oracle, this mysterious old lady who can see the future and, like, trains children who have the potential to become the One. And she talks to Neo and reveals to him, Yeah, you ain't the fucking One, dude. You're just, you're just a dude. You're a powerful dude. You have potential to be stronger, but nah, you ain't the One. Oh, by the way, Morpheus is going to die saving you, so that sucks. Actually, he's given a choice. Either Neo dies or Morpheus dies. Yeah. That was an interesting scene with all the telekinetic children bending the spoon. There's a lot of references to Alice in Wonderland in this movie, and particularly with that scene. Like, follow the white rabbit. Obviously, that's obvious. But when they're in the Oracle's home with all the children, you can see that movie... Uh, I forget which one it was. It was the one with the giant rabbit, like evil rabbits that we should totally watch and review for this. No, is it called the terror or something like that? I'm going to look it up. I'm looking it up right now. While he's looking that up, the stuff at the Oracle is really good. You get children bending spoons with their mind. You get the Oracle, like as Neo enters her kitchen, she says, Oh, by the way, don't worry about the vase. What vase? And then he bumps into a vase and knocks it over. And then she's like, now here's the fun part. Would you have broken it if I didn't tell you? Fucking mind trip, bro. That's not how the Oracle talks. But the movie would be better if she does, I guess. Night of the Lepus. That's it. So anyway, we've talked about how one of the guys in Morpheus' crew, Cypher, is super sus. We neglected to mention the fact that it was confirmed that he is betraying them. He, like, sells them out to Agent Smith, and the agents ambush them as they're coming back from the Oracle. There is this big fight scene, and Morpheus allows himself to be captured so Neo can get away because he thinks Neo is the one. And Cypher manages to make it out of the Matrix, back to the ship where all the bodies are. And then he just starts killing the crew. And he's really fucking creepy to Trinity, like... He tells her that he's loved her for years. Yeah, and he, like, sniffs her hair. Yeah. You know, that must suck to be an actor. Like, you walk into a audition, and they're like, Oh, yeah, you just look like the type of guy who would be good at sniffing women's hair creepily. <laughs> yeah, so Cypher, his whole deal is that he's secretly been meeting with Agent Smith behind Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity's back in order to go back into the Matrix having completely forgotten everything that has happened. Basically, he'd rather live in blissful ignorance than fight for the truth and fight for what's real. Like, he'd rather just live a normal life than continue this seemingly endless confrontation of war and death and suffering, which is a very interesting character perspective, especially in a story like this. It's very interesting. So he sells out the entire team in order to become an actor and be rich, famous, someone important. Just before he is able to kill Neo, Tank shoots and kills him. Yeah, Tank is a character we didn't mention. He's the crew's, like, tech guy who, like, manages them while they're in the program. And he got shot and taken out by Cypher earlier, but he comes back. But, oh, oh, shit. Everyone's dead but Tank, Neo, and Trinity, and Morpheus is captured. Well, that's bad. At least Cypher got shot. Fuck that, dude. But yeah, we forgot to mention Morpheus getting kidnapped. They're trying to get to the extraction point, but then Neo notices a glitch in the Matrix, 
Which is a cat that walked past yeah. twice. Well, if it was just like two different black cats, like there are a lot of black cats in Chicago. They just narrowly escape. Morpheus sacrifices himself to save Neo because he's thoroughly convinced that Neo's the one. Which, if you rearrange Neo, the name Neo, it spells oh, one. Oh, God, I didn't even realize that. Now I feel dumb and also think this movie isn't very smart. Yeah, it's a little on the nose with its imagery. Agent Smith begins interrogating Morpheus to, like, find out the locations of all the human rebels out there so he can kill them. And, mmm, it's a good interrogation scene. Hugo Weaving is at his best. He says that humans aren't mammals, they're a virus because they just spread and spread and spread. Hey, rabbits. Like, what the fuck are you talking about, Agent Smith, even though that's a cool line? And Neo, Trandy, and Tank are given a choice. Either they can kill Morpheus while he's asleep, so he can't spill the secrets after they torture him, or they can go into the Matrix and go up against an army and try and rescue Morpheus. I mean, one is easier than the other, in fairness. Do we need to say what they do? They're gonna go in to save fucking Morpheus! And they bring a ton of fucking guns with them! And there's this insane shootout in the lobby of the building where they're keeping Morpheus, and it's so fucking cool. Guns. Lots of guns. That shootout is a great scene. And I especially like that scene where Agent Smith is trying to hack into Morpheus's brain, and he's telling him, like, this is not the first incarnation of the Matrix the robots have created. The first few were, like, utopias where everyone's perfect. The reason why it didn't work is because humans thrive off conflict. There might be this innate nature for aggression and hate and fear, which obviously is an interesting conversation brought up by the villain. Also, I really like that part where he grabbed Morpheus's face and is like, listen, I hate it here. This place sucks. I need to get out. And in order to get out, I need to complete my purpose, which is destroying Zion. Zion, the hu last human city, which is Hebrew for sanctuary. So we only get it in name in this movie, but it does come back in the sequel. So in a very impressive action scenes, Neo and Trinity break out Morpheus. They shoot up the lobby, destroy elevators, steal a helicopter, get to the roof. There's that iconic bullet time scene where Neo throws himself back, dodging the bullets. There's this great bit where the helicopter with Trinity is going to crash and like Neo like barely saves her and it's really cool. And then the helicopter crashes into a building and we see just the ripples through the glass as it shatters. Something we haven't really touched on. This movie came out in 1999. This looks really fucking good for a movie that came out in 1999. Yeah, absolutely. The, the CGI, it isn't, I mean, obviously it's been 22 years. It doesn't look as good as CGI does today, but it still looks really good. It still holds up very well. Anyway, Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity go to a subway station to try and exit the Matrix. And... I'm going to interject here with a minor detail that only you and I will care about. No one listening this to will care about. But did you catch the street corner they said the subway station that the climax takes place is on? Yeah, it's like Lake and Wabash, right? Uh, yes, that happens later. But no, the like big subway where there's the confrontation with Smith and Neo, that is on State and Balbo. And, like, as I'm watching this, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, I know that street corner. You and I used to live, like, half a block away from that. Yeah, yeah. There's a bar there, and also a parking lot where my mother's car got towed once, even though she paid the parking meter because the tow truck driver was an idiot. Like, hey, I know that subway station. Honestly, it's weird that the climax of this movie doesn't feature just a bunch of college kids walking around crying about their overpriced schooling. Yeah, so this movie takes place in Chicago, which took me a while to figure out. I'm like, that looks like Chicago. I mean, it never says Chicago. It's just like, wait, hold on. Wabash Lake State. Oh, shit. Those are streets in Chicago where the Wachowskis are from. Anyway, done with this tangent no one cares about. Trandy and Morpheus get out, but... Agent Smith blows up the phone booth and has his final confrontation with Neo. And it's very cool. Like, there's a bunch of martial arts going back punches and blocks. And, like, they get tackled into the subway tracks. And, like, Agent Smith is holding down Neo. And, like, 
calls him Mr. Anderson. My name is Neo. Throws him off. He gets hit by the train as Neo gets away. Man, this is a cool movie. That's definitely a word to describe it as cool. Before Neo can escape the Matrix, obviously Agent Smith attacks him, throws him in front of a subway train. And he's holding him in a headlock. He's like, this is the sound of inevitability. Hugo Weaving's great in this. And so is Lawrence Fishburne, who plays Morpheus. We haven't said his name yet, but he is great as Morpheus. Just this cool, mysterious mentor with sunglasses that would probably fall off in real life. Lawrence Fishburne's great in this. Hugo Weaving's great in this. Keanu Reeves is also in this movie. Yeah, exactly. Like, I get a lot of hate from people because I don't think... Like, I understand Keanu Reeves is a great person. Like, I've seen him in interviews. He does so much charity work and not even just charity work. He just, just the way he treats people, he's just genuinely a nice person. And he's great in an action scene. But in terms of his dialogue and line delivery, the dude just has never been good. No. <laughs> like, no, he's D. This is his best performance, I do think. This is his best performance, but like he is decent in this. But. Let's just say in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, his acting was at whoa. And in this movie, he's at whoa. Neo's a very reserved character because most characters played by Keanu Reeves are. He's very calm and doesn't really react. He's an awkward computer yeah. hacker. Keanu Reeves is fine. His acting is fine in this movie. It's passable. It's not great. But it's passable, and the reason you won Keanu Reeves is because goddamn he is good at action movies. He is. And especially all the wire work that they do. Yeah, it's really good. Carrie Ann Moss is also really great in this, for what she's given. Although, like, because Trinity and Neo are both very stoic, reserved characters, and because we haven't said anything about their romance yet, but because this is an action movie and they're the male and female leads, you know it ends with them getting together. I don't really think the romance works too good. Not at because all. Because just having these stoic, quiet characters be in love with each other just makes it feel very emotionless. The thing about it is... I didn't even think, like, it maybe crossed my mind once or twice while watching it that they'd get in a romance. But, like, it was so unnatural that when she was like, I love you, I was like, what, what? You do? That never crossed my mind because it was so poorly done. Yeah, oh, and she, like, says in the climax as Neo's dying, like, the Oracle told me when I was a little girl, when I went to her to see if I was the one, she said to me, yeah, you ain't the fucking one, but you're gonna fall in love with the guy who is the one, which, well, that's a mean thing to say to a kid. But, yeah, I don't like the romance too much in this. It's, eh. Speaking of the romance, we get the climax year climax after Smith is defeated where Neo takes on the other two agents. And also Smith after he responds because they're immortal. They're computer programs where Neo unlocks his full the one powers. And like earlier in the movie, there's a moment where Neo's like, oh, so I'll be able to dodge bullets. And Morpheus is like, no, you won't have to. And then it gets paid off in the climax where they shoot at Neo and he just holds his hand up and the bolts stop and he like blows Smith up and effortlessly takes out the agents. It's great. But while all this is happening, the robots are attacking the ship in the real life and they got to launch an EMP to destroy the robots so they'll survive. But that would kill Neo because he's in the Matrix. So... There's this time limit, and Rez, the robots are about to kill Neo. Neo escapes, and they launch the MP, and everyone survives. Yay! And now Neo's a god. And he sends out a signal throughout the Matrix saying, like, look, we're the resistance. We're going to save you. And that's pretty much the end. And then he flies. Yeah, he just fucking flies away. And that's the end of the movie. So, can I say what the worst part of this movie is? And it isn't Keanu Reeves' acting, and it isn't the romance, although those are also bad. I don't really like the plot line with the one. Like, uh, it just doesn't do anything for me. Neo is the one. He's the chosen one because he's the chosen one and has the potential to save the world. It's not him being the chosen one because he's brave or more determined or anything. It's just, oh, you're the chosen one, I guess. Oh, cool. What does that mean? It means you're the chosen one. Ah, 
I think this is a very, very weak Chosen One narrative. Yeah, I mean, Chosen One narratives in general are very overplayed and just tired from my perspective. Like, it just doesn't work. And it is established, spoiler alert for the sequels, but it is established that the prophecy of the Chosen One, it's all bullshit. That's better than what's in this. Honestly, I would have preferred in this movie if after he realizes he's not the Chosen One and then goes to save Morpheus anyway... They kept that he wasn't the chosen one, or at the very least, did what the sequels, I haven't seen the sequels, but from what you say, do with, you aren't the chosen one, but you're fighting anyway, and that allows you to do the things you do. Yeah, exactly. Like, there is no such thing as the chosen one, but because he is an anomaly in the position to basically do what the chosen one would do, and therefore, that's what he is. He's the savior, nonetheless. I think the chosen one narrative that the whole film is centered around is just kind of eh. Honestly, as I was watching this, like getting back to Speed Racer, which, hey, lots of people compare Speed Racer to The Matrix. We're comparing The Matrix to Speed Racer. I was left with, huh, this was the same pair of directors and that all the action is really, really good and cool, but also the story is just eh. And I don't like the structure of the plot. Like, this is much, 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 much better made, but my thoughts on it are basically the same. The action's cool, the science is dumb, the Chosen One stuff is boring. Some of the acting's really good, some of it's eh. Yeah, I do think the plot, I don't know, I liked it. It had this sense of, like I said, quirkiness to it, but I don't know, like at the end of the day, I don't know, I think it worked for me personally. No, it's a really good movie, it's fine. The action's good. Yeah, the action's great, the special effects are really great, especially for the time. It came out the same year as Phantom Menace, which is funny to think about because, you know, that could have been one of two really great sci-fi movies coming out that year, but thanks, George Lucas. It's the anti-Phantom Menace. This is a really good movie that gets worse with each sequel. That was a really bad movie that gets better with each sequel. I mean, I'd argue Attack of the Clones is worse, but that that's for a later episode. Revenge of the Sith is actually okay if you ignore all the dumb stuff. Yeah, which is a lot of it. Getting back to The Matrix, the action was great and really started the trend in the same way that Halloween invigorated the slasher genre in American cinema. The Matrix did the exact same for this type of sci-fi action. And it cannot be understated how important this movie is in cinema. They're making a fourth one. It's coming out later this year. They made two sequels and a collection of short films called The Animatrix, which would be interesting to take a look at. Side note, there are four soon-to-be-five Matrix movies, if you count The Animatrix. Three of them came out the same year. That's a lot of Matrix in that year. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Reloaded came out in... March, and then Revolutions came out in November, I want to uh, say. I don't know. They they did come out the oh same Oh, God, year, it's though. even worse. It was May and November. Honestly, people, like, when they talk about the series, they kind of just combine those two in their heads. And that's why, because so close together. Hey, why haven't they given a subtitle for The Matrix? Is it just The Matrix 4? Like, what's the RE? Like, because you got Reloaded, you got Revolutions. What's your mid-season red versus blue subtitle you're gonna give it i don't know requiem that would actually be good the rumor that i heard is that the plot is gonna revolve around the fact that the matrix trilogy is a movie series within the matrix and it's like this entire time it's been just a ploy to distract people or whatever well i mean like within the matrix i'm pretty sure the sequels just have neo do his one stuff in real life so Yeah, all of this was in the Matrix, definitely. It's a fucking Matroska doll, or however you pronounce that, of Matrixes. It's that one episode of Rick and Morty. Now that we've gone off topic, as we always do, I believe that means it's time to give number. What number you give movie. Yeah, so this movie has great action, a revolutionary plot, or not revolutionary, but really great plot, mostly great acting, apart from Keanu Reeves, who's just... Good, I would argue. Also, that's very charitable. There are some less than stellar elements, the romance, the way certain plot elements 
develop. Overall, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. I think it's a great movie, and I'm glad I finally got the opportunity to watch it. I think everybody should watch this. It's very important and a damn good movie. Yeah, I'm going to have to give the same score, 9 out of 10. It's a good movie. The way I think about this, like, I give the same kind of scores a lot. Like, for me, 8.5 is good, 9 is really good, 9.5 is near perfection. And, God, the way this film is shot is near perfection. I just, the, like, Chosen One stuff is dumb. And if it wasn't for that, this would be a 9.5 out of 10. It's a very, very, very good movie. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, this is a great movie. Going from a movie that came out, like, the same year you and I were born, because we're the same age i'm pretty sure to a movie that isn't even out yet because we're gonna have to wait a few days for it we're gonna review black widow next week the new marvel movie that's a prequel that gives a backstory for black widow that maybe they should have given her before they killed her off so her death would have had more impact just saying thanks ike perlmutter Well, honestly, normally in this, we have a good bar on what critics and fans say about it that we can use to, like, gauge our expectations. Like, okay, so The Matrix is going to be really good. Plan 9 is going to be really bad. This movie's not even fucking out yet. I don't know how good it's going to be. I'm guessing probably 8.5 out of 10. It looks pretty cool. It has Taskmaster as the villain and David Harbour as fat Russian Captain America. Like, shit, that's going to be good. Everything you've ever wanted. So yeah, I'm pumped for that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. They had like 20 Marvel movies in 10 years, and now it's been like two since we got one. I need my comfort food movie series about superheroes. And that is not to say I don't think critically. Anyway, Riley, where can they find more about this show? You can all find us at Silver Age Silver Screen on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, where we post updates to the show and a lot of content on there. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Riley James Thorpe, and you can find me on YouTube at Riley Thorpe, where you can check out all of my short films. Casey, how about you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Jarms Casey, J A R M E S C A S E Y. I also have a YouTube channel, but it's Casey Jarms because I'm smart. And on that YouTube channel right now, I'm up... Well, actually, by the time this comes out, it'll all be out. But uploading a series of video essays about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and also kind of about the Captain America films that preceded them and the political implications and ranting about why I don't like Flag Smashers as a villain. And it's good. It's called The Politics of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It's three videos. Life and Times of Steve Rogers. The Power of Propaganda, and A Symbol Redefined. Go watch those. We'll be back next week, assuming we don't get betrayed by the dude with the goatee. And, as always, my name is Casey Jarms. And I'm Riley Thorpe. And hey, it's just a movie. Don't lose your head about it. Especially not to a ladder.